Benvenuto, welcome. Thank you, Andrea. Please take a seat. So welcome, Eric, and uh, thanks for being again in, here in Milan. And let, let's talk Africa, because you did really well when the market was down, when Africa was weak, and then last year you did not that well. So yeah. what happened and how can you describe that? Okay, thank you, Andrea. Yeah, it's good to be here, guys, and good to talk about Africa. Um, yeah, so uh, we had a, in the beginning of 2016, we had a short position in commodity mining companies. Um, this is a position that we'd had, a, a theme that we'd had for two years prior, and it, it, had, it had been working well, but um, I think by the beginning of 2016, maybe it was a very consensus trade, um, and there was an inflection point in the commodity cycle. Commodities started to go up, and these short positions went against the fund and hurt the performance in the beginning of the year. Um, since that time, we've done a lot of analysis of our fund and, and how we can reduce the volatility, improve performance. And so we've done a lot of um, risk management and um, a lot of studying of factor attribution in the fund. So we're trying to make the fund, um, we're focusing on stock picking, uh, bottom-up analysis, and making sure we don't have too much exposure to one factor anymore. So now we, we analyze how, what's our exposure to commodities. What's Is our, that what you learned? Yeah, that was what we learned, yes, and that's what we've been implementing in the fund um, since that time and making sure it's more diversified. And well, well, looking at you know, the, the performance since August, the volatility is down. Did you change anything in the investment process? What, what's, the, what's the difference? Yeah, the investment process is still the same. We still go out, out to visit all these companies and find great ideas and do the bottom-up work, but when we put it all together at the end, uh, we're just very careful to look at when it all comes together, are we overexposed to one factor, making sure it's very diversified, um, strict price targets. When we get close to price targets, we try to make sure we lock in some of that profit. And um, so as a result, I think the fund is bottom up, alpha driven, and uh, not as not such a big thematic short exposure like we had in early 2016. Now, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the uh, Trump world, the new order, uh, economic and financial of the world, will, the impact will be in Africa and do you think that the markets you're investing in will change in, in which way? Yeah, I think, um, I think Trump should be good for emerging markets and we're already seeing that in the performance year to date. Um, first of all, Trump's trying to get the U.S. to pick up, uh, trying to improve the growth rate in the U.S., uh, reducing taxes, reducing regulation, trying to be more business friendly. And any pickup you see in U.S. growth is going to be good for the world and good for emerging markets. Uh, second, he's really focused on infrastructure. So he wants to create tax incentives to see imp uh, more infrastructure investment in the U.S. So to the extent the U.S. invests more in infrastructure, that's probably going to trickle down to commodity demand and commodity prices, which is good for emerging markets and it's good for um, commodity prices, especially good for Africa. Um, third, I think we're seeing that Trump wants a weak dollar. And this is kind of a major shift. Uh, we've had a strong dollar trend since 2000, late 2011, 2012. Um, he said it numerous times. He wants the U.S. to be competitive in manufacturing. So I think Trump wants a weak dollar. That should be good for emerging markets. Um, but one, one other thing I wanted to, there's a lot of focus on Trump. But there's another guy that you should probably be focusing a lot more than Trump, and that's uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China. Which in China has been historically more present yeah, than, than when, the yeah. U.S. in general. Yeah, exactly. When you're in the emerging markets, you definitely feel China more than the U.S. And um, <coughs> if you get a moment, there was uh, the president of China addressed the Davos Economic Forum in January, and he gave a very uh, mm -hmm. inspiring speech about how China had embraced globalization, uh, it was very, and he explained that it was very scary for China, for China to open up its markets to the world. Um, and, but they did, and they did, it, it helped China grow a lot. He said, you know, look, China has a plan to continue to grow, and the country's open, the market's open for everybody. They want people to come participate in China's growth. And he also said China's going to be investing into emerging markets to open up the rest of the world. And um, they have a big policy called One Belt, One Road. It's kind of a strange name. I don't know. Maybe it means something better in Chinese. Um, but um, they're investing $50 billion into infrastructure around the emerging markets to open up these, these uh, markets to China and to the rest of the world. 
And we're especially seeing that in Africa, uh, investment in trains, ports, rail. And um, so I think Trump should be good for emerging markets, but really uh, the guy that we should be focusing on more is the uh, president of China. He's Xi Jinping. So yeah. give us you know, an update on what's going on into the African economy, especially in the countries where you focus more. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I'll start with um, Egypt, uh, one of the bigger exposures in our fund. Egypt had a kind of a tough year last year. They had to ask the IMF for some help. They uh, got a $12 billion loan from the IMF. Um, and in the history of emerging markets, these IMF, uh, when the IMF comes in, it actually can be quite positive, uh, as long as you weren't there going into it. Um, but uh, in return for this uh, $12 billion package, the IMF asked for uh, a lot of changes to tax reform in Egypt, lowering budget deficits. They wanted to make business easier for small Egyptian companies, so um, reduce some regulations that Egyptian, uh, Egyptian some of the really uh, reduce some of the bureaucracy, um, and also uh, requested that Egypt invest more in infrastructure, such as uh, the rail system in Cairo. Um, and then the third part of the uh, bailout was for Egypt to devalue its currency. So there was a 90% devaluation of the pound. I mean, imagine that 90% move in the currency in three months. Um, we weren't exposed to Egypt, so it turned out to be a great opportunity. We came in and we've been buying uh, companies at six to seven times earnings with uh, good growth potential. And oh, by the way, the IMF thinks that with these reforms, Egypt should be able to grow around 6% a year in the next few years. And 6% is really good. I mean, I think that's going to be one of the highest growth rates in the world. Um, Kenya looks great on the uh, chart, 5.9%, but that's a bit slower than it has been in the past. And um, Kenya's doing well, but they're having a bit of, uh, some of their banks are having a bit of an asset quality problem. Not, it's not a crisis, but there's a bit of a slowdown in the banking system. And this is also an election year in Kenya. And uh, in Africa, whenever there's an election, things slow down. So the election is in August, and businesses are slowing. They want to see who's going to win. <coughs> is the election going to go smoothly? Because in the past, it hasn't always been a, a, a certain thing that elections will go smoothly. But now, it's starting to, it's starting to be more, it's starting to be more, uh, it's becoming a habit that elections are going well in Africa, but there's still that caution. So I think, though, the good thing is, um, I think this is going to be an opportunity for us to invest in more in Kenya. We only have one, uh, one position, but I think we're going to have, um, I think there's going to be more stocks to buy. Um, I think the worst performer you can see on the chart is Nigeria, just uh, very exposed to the oil price uh, being low. Uh, kind of been poorly managed. Uh, they've had pr production problems. The government's mm -hmm. been not been managing the country well. The stock market has been awful. We don't have any exposure to Nigeria, but it's, it's down about 60%. And actually, I look at it and I go, this could be a great opportunity as well. Um, I think we're going to see a little bit more currency weakness in Nigeria. But like Kenya, I think Nigeria is another thing that we're, uh, we're watching to uh, invest in. And then finally, South Africa. Uh, South Africa is the biggest uh, country, or biggest economy in uh, Africa, uh, biggest stock market as well, and we're quite active in South Africa. Uh, you can see the growth's a little low; uh, it's below one percent. Uh, the country's the country's functioning well, but there's just a lot of pessimism around. Uh, sorry, a lot of negativity around the current uh, president, Jacob Zuma. He's not very business friendly, and South African companies have been taking a lot of money out of the country, investing in Europe, investing in Australia. And I, but I think. Um, in December, we have uh, the leading party, the ANC, which is Jacob Zuma's party. It's probably going to change its leadership and be more business friendly. They've been losing election, local elections and a lot of pressure on them. So I think we're going to get a better government as of December. And I think you could have a real uh, surprising uptick in investment in, Africa, in South Africa as companies bring money back into the country. Uh, there's a lot of wealth Has there. Has the round bottom or what? Um, that's a really tough one. Uh, I am going to say we are we've we've positioned the portfolio to be not be sensitive to that one way or the other. So it's very hedged around the rand. Um, but I, if if they change, if we get a good leader in mm -hmm. December, it'll be off to the races. The rand will do very well. Um, so I, I I tend to think the rand should have bottomed. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Is there any other new country you're trying to explore to find opportunities, and where are you looking? Um, 
we're, we're going to try and do a little bit more um, with Morocco. It's, a, it's not a market we've looked at much, um, but that's, that's in the beginning stages right now. But, uh, but that is another market we, should, we can be doing more in. So how's the funds positioned ent entering 2017? Yeah, um, I'm going to start with this chart is the geographical exposure of the fund. Um, because I'd like to point out the Egypt exposure. I spoke about Egypt. You can see it's our biggest exposure with a net, uh, net exposure of 21%. And that's just, we're finding really cheap companies uh, with growth trading at six or seven times earnings where if you look, and I look at the peer groups globally, and a lot of these companies, if they were listed in Europe, could be trading at 14 to 15 times earnings. So I think there's a lot of upside in Egypt. It's been doing well for the fund, and I think it's going to continue to do well. Um, Next, going on to the, um, uh, the sector exposures. So you see in the, uh, we have a, um, we're finding a lot of value in the mining sector. Um, the, uh, you can see we have it split between uh, diversif uh, gold mining and diversified mining. The, uh, so since 2015, what's happened is uh, commodity prices have bounced, and yet the mining companies have cut a lot of costs, and they're not investing in new mines. So you have the combination of revenues going up, costs coming down a lot, and these mines are generating a record amount of free cash flow. They're generating more free cash flow now than they were when the commodity prices are higher because they're not investing in new mines. So um, the companies are still scared that commodity prices might go down, so they're using this cash to pay down debt and pay dividends to shareholders. So they're actually, it's kind of one of the best times to be owning them. They're uh, you know, going to be paying dividends. So, um, and meanwhile, investors are very scared about investing in mining companies after you know, all the turmoil the last few years. So the stocks are still quite cheap. Um, investors are still kind of underweight the sector. And so uh, I think they're just, there's just a lot of value there. Um, one other theme is infrastructure in Africa. And we own three different companies that build out uh, primarily power infrastructure. So they build out power plants high-speed transmission lines, uh, metering systems. And uh, this is something, uh, we talk about infrastructure investment. It's actually happening There's a, uh, in Africa there. These companies all have record order books, and they're all trading at five to eight times earnings. Uh, so I find them very attractive. Um, I'm thinking of like a, a company we own in Egypt called El Sawidi. It trades at six times earnings. If you were to look at something in Europe, like a Schneider Electric, they'd be 15 times earnings. Same business, same contracts. Um, it's just very big uh, discrepancy in the valuation. Um, and, and also, infrastructure is happening in Africa. There's a lot of invest. Uh, you're getting money from the w, uh, IMF, the World Bank, from China. And there's also a lot of infrastructure funds. I don't know if you've been you know, catching the news about these, these private equity firms are launching you know, $9 billion infrastructure funds. And so there's a lot of support for this. So that's a sector um, we like a lot. And then finally, um, uh, we're all, I'm always interested in uh, technology in Africa. And um, we do have one, one position I really like in uh, network integration. And the theme is in Africa, but it's probably something that you, we see any, everywhere, is that um, for companies just <laughs> with the cloud, with mobile and internet and new, new software, it's just getting very hard for companies to um, keep track of the different technologies. And so increasingly, they're outsourcing all of this. So uh, this is one. And, and the earnings of these. I, I, the analogy I use is, I think 30 years ago, we could all have fixed something on our car. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you could fix it, change a spark plug. Or, but I think nowadays, if you opened up a new BMW, Mercedes, you, know, you, you couldn't touch it. And I think that's what's happening with technology. I think it's getting too complicated for companies. So tell us more about commodities, because it has a huge impact, not just on the fund, but in general on the African economy. Is, with the rising prices that we are experiencing, do you think this is just a cyclical rebound, or it's more structural? What do you see? Yeah, that's a really tough question, and, and we think about it all the time. But um, it's looking like it's not, I'm not sure it's an economic uh, commodity super cycle again, but it's looking increasingly sustainable. Um, the reason I say it is China, shows, China has showed that they don't want commodities to crash. Um, you're still seeing a lot of um, uh, government lending in China to, to uh, spur infrastructure investment. Um, so China's, China seems to be stable. 
And then we always talk about China, but we forget about the other half of the world. In terms of commodities, it's about 50% China, 50%. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, I think we're going to see a pickup in commodity de demand from the US, especially if there's more infrastructure investment. And I think when we go to Europe, and, and maybe even Japan, um, I think people are tired of QE. And I think they want to see real activity, real jobs, real construction. And so you know, this might be a, trend, may be a trend in Europe as well, where you get a pickup in uh, construction and infrastructure investment in Europe as well. So I think, um, mm -hmm. so, so, so on the demand side, I think demand is stable and may be picking up. And on the supply side, you have um, the mining companies are still in shock. And they're not investing in new mines. So you have very limited supply. You have a couple mines that were started years ago that are still coming online. But you have very limited new supply coming. So um, you do have the setup where it could be not only stable, it could be, it could be much higher. That's interesting. And we saw a lot of numbers. But I know that you brought in some pictures that give us more the sense of what's going on yeah. in some aspects of the African economy. Yeah. Why, did, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, with no, that? I, uh, I think sometimes we, by lunchtime, we get tired of the, the charts <laughs> and we want uh, pictures. Um, uh, this is uh, Cape Town. And I, you know, sometimes they say one person can change a country or change a world. And um, I think this city uh, is, gonna, is having a big change in Africa. It is, it's beautiful, it's world class. Um, there's a lot, it's a very safe city. There's a lot of, you can see it's, it's, um, it's a very attractive city. It reminds me of San Francisco. And I think um, increasingly Africans, especially in South Africa in particular, they're visiting Cape Town and they're saying, why can't my city look like that? Why can't the power work and the water and the plum, everything work in my city? And um, you know, here's a city in Africa, run by Africans, and it's world class. And I think it's a great example of how things can work. And you're seeing this in the uh, local elections in South Africa. So last year was a big year. Cape Town is run by the Democratic Alliance, not the ruling party, they're the opposition party. But in the, mayor, in the city elections, the Democratic Alliance took over Johannesburg and Port Elizabeth, two pretty big towns in South Africa, especially Johannesburg. That's the biggest uh, city in the country. So, from the ground up, people are going, look, we want change. We want accountable politicians. We want clean cities. We want crime down. And I think they're looking at Cape Town and going, look, if they can do it, why can't we? And so I, I think this is a, um, I think it's also an interesting city for real estate investment. But I think it's, it's bigger than that. Um, you know, I, I've been speaking about infrastructure. And sometimes it's just better to just see it happening. This is a uh, diesel refinery under construction in Cairo. I visited this last year. This is the first new refinery to be constructed in Egypt since the 1960s. Um, Egypt imports all of its diesel, or a lot of its diesel, from Europe. But they're saying, why can't we refine this here in, in uh, Egypt? So this, is, this should be complete by next year. Trains. I love trains. Um, this, this train, uh, this is the. Uh, this is in Kenya, and there is a, um, they're building a train to connect the port of Mombasa to Nairobi. Now, right now, about 95% of the cargo from the port is going by truck. The, tr the roads are congested. It's slow. It's awful. Um, and they said, look, we need a train to do this. Why can't we have this? So they, um, they launched this project in 2014. And it should be, this train should be completed by the end of the year. It's being constructed by the Chinese and financed by the Chinese. And uh, this is a ceremony uh, as the <laughs> locomotives were, are being delivered. Um, more trains. Um, this train uh, is in Mozambique. It's 1,000 kilometers long. And it was started in 2013 and uh, was finally completed last year. Uh, connects the, a port in Mozambique to the inland area. Uh, primarily hauls coal right now, but it is going to do containers as well. So, you know, look, this stuff is happening. It's, these are, this isn't talk. It's, it's, it's done. Um, I love this woman. Uh, I don't know if you can read it. She's got her cell phone number on the top. And she's earned a degree in chemical engineering. And she's got her resume, and she's on the street trying to get a job. And I think that's just uh, what you see every day in Africa is this attitude. They want to learn. They want to do well. They want to achieve. They want uh, a job. And she's out there just hoping that someone is going to drive by and need a chemical engineer. 
It, it's not LinkedIn, but I hope it yeah, works. Yeah, no, I'm sure she's on LinkedIn too, but she's just not gonna, she's gonna go out and get her job. I love it. Um, this is just a picture about, I was trying to capture um, the mobile and, uh, and the internet in Africa, and I know it's a trend globally, but I think it's especially important in Africa. It's always been, uh, Africa's been very disconnected from the world. Um, and I, you're getting about 100% mobile penetration in Africa. The, phone, the uh, phone companies are showing that data growth is 30% and every year. Uh, so you're saying data growth, uh, very widespread uh, penetration of a mobile. And you know you see them using it. The Africans are way ahead of the U.S. I mean, my bank in the U.S. in terms of mobile banking, mobile payments. So uh, they're using these phones very well. I mean, also Uber is very popular in Africa. And I talk to these drivers, and they love that they're their own business. They got their phone, their car, and here they, it's becoming popular due to the taxis. Yeah, stars, right. You know? <laughs> I, I know, I know. Um, so I think that's very important. Uh, fi uh, final slide. Um, this is a picture of Aliko Dangote. He's the richest entrepreneur in Africa. He started a big cement company. It's all over Africa. He's worth about $12 billion. And this is a picture from 2015 when he's speaking at the Davos Economic Forum. And I just think for Africans, this is, like a, this is great to see uh, you know, a, f a fellow African make money in a clean you know, business, start a business, do well, and then be on the world stage sharing his opinions and views and, every, and world leaders want to know what he thinks. And it's just a great role model for entrepreneurs in Africa to see a guy like this doing so well. Now, thanks for this update and yeah, these so beautiful pictures. There's a question, the only one I got from the audience is, how about the role that the fund might play in their portfolios and what kind of returns are you expecting in 2017? Wow, what kind of role? Well, I hope it's a positive role for people's portfolios. Um, look, I, you know, it's tough to say. You don't want to say a target, but there is a target. Um, I really want to do 15% this year. I have to make up. We had a bad year last year, so we need to not only make up for last year, we need to mm -hmm. more than compensate for it. So that is the target, and we all are very experienced financial investors, so we know there's a lot of things can happen. But... Um, we're really focusing, working hard to find stocks with a lot of upside, um, good ideas on the both of the long side, the short side, and that are diversified. So we're not going to get. Uh, we're trying to be prepared for surprises, but that's the that's the um, that's the goal. Eric Renander, thanks again for being here today. Thank you. Grazie.